Above us, Hell 165 seemed to be knocking on our steel hull as it creaked and contracted under the enormous pressure. 2200. The barrage increased in violence as dusk closed in on surface. Wild attacks at shorter intervals indicated that the enemy had lost his patience. May 14th. By midnight, we had approached the limit for boat and crew. We had reached a depth of 280 metres and the boat was still sinking. I dragged myself through the aisle, pushing and tossing men around, forcing them to stay awake. Whoever fell asleep might never be awakened. 0310. A thunderous spread rattled down, but without effect. We were closer to being crushed by the mounting pressure than by the exploding canisters. As the echo of the last blast slowly subsided, something else attracted our attention. It was the thrashing of retreating propellers. For a long time, we listened to the fading sound, unable to believe that the Tommies had given up the hunt. 4.30. For over an hour, there was silence. We spent all that time doubting our luck. We had to make sure, so we turned on our fresh water producer, went high with the motors. No reaction from above. Using the last of our compressed air and battery power, the chief managed to lift the overloaded boat metre by metre. Then, unable to slow her upward movement, Friedrich let her rise freely and yelled, Boat rises fast. Fifty metres. Boat has surfaced. C-250 broke through to air and life. We pushed ourselves up to the bridge. Around us spread the infinite beauty of night, sky and ocean. Stars glittered brilliantly, and the sea breathed gently. The moment of rebirth was overwhelming. A minute ago we could not believe that we were alive. Now we could not believe that death had kept his finger on us for thirty-five gruesome hours. Abruptly, I felt the impact of the oxygen-rich air upon my system. Almost losing consciousness, I sagged to my knees and slumped over the rim of the bridge. There I stayed until I regained my faculties. The captain recovered quickly, and we congratulated each other on another miraculous survival. 166. Iron Coffins Then the captain called out, Arboth Diesel's half ahead. Steer 180. Ventilate boat. Secure from action stations. Siegmann had thrown the dice again. The diesels coughed to life. Since the convoy had disappeared long ago, we travelled south, toward our last position. The engines muttered reassuringly, topping off our drained batteries and pushing the boat toward a new sunrise. The bilges were emptied, the foul air expelled, and the accumulated refuse thrown overboard. When the darkness dissolved and a new day dawned, U-230 was again ready for combat. Still numb from the murderous assault and stiff from the cold depth, we added up our account. Three U-boats in our group had been sunk. Well over 100 Allied ships had ploughed past us, and we had not been able to sink a single one. We might now expect that some 700,000 tonnes of war material would safely reach the British Isles. It was not a pretty picture. The day promised to become a good one. Praga lifted his heavy frame to the bridge and shot several stars before the sun wiped them off the sky. I lit up a cigarette and watched the sunrise. The sky changed from dark blue to violet, turned purple and then bloody red. I remembered an old saying, Red sky in the morning, early death's warning, and wondered what the day might bring. 7.10 Smoke clouds dead ahead, reported the first mate. All glasses spun to bear on a smudge over the horizon in the southwest. There was no doubt about it. We had sighted a second convoy. At that moment it occurred to me the escorts had left us knowing that we would sooner or later fall into the hands of destroyers in the following convoy. 0720. U-230 dived. The crew, without sleep for at least 70 hours, manned their stations wearily. They had hollow cheeks, pale faces, red eyes. Their haunted glances told me they understood things had changed drastically that they knew they were nearer to the ocean floor than to port. I walked through the compartments, clapped a shoulder here, made a joke there, 
and managed to say some encouraging words. Yo 745. A voice came through the tube. From sound man to captain, propeller noise wanders to starboard. Enemy's course must be east, not north. The captain muttered an oath into his beard, searched again with the scope, spotted nothing, then ordered the boat to surface. It suddenly struck me that the event had a certain similarity to the one we had experienced three days before. 0750. The two of us rushed through the hatch, surveyed the sky and located the convoy. It was obvious that the parade had made its morning zigzag and was now travelling away from us, just as the previous convoy had done. What had seemed an easy catch was suddenly beyond reach. Without further consideration, we began the chase. KT-2. Aircraft from the sun. A rapid dive brought us well below the detonating bombs. The chief raised the boat immediately, and soon we floated at periscope depth. The sky was empty. Seconds later, Siegmann snapped up the periscope handles, stood up as the scope hissed back into its tube, and cursed angrily. The devil with these birds! That plane has dropped a smoke bomb! Let's get away from here, Chief! Surface with high speed! E0832. U-230 raced east and away from the thick black fumes that marked our position. Far off, astern to starboard, the masses of ships revealed their masts and funnels. Corvettes and destroyers zigzagged in a striking display of coordinated power. Euro 0855. A twin-engine plane attacked from behind. U-230 went down within seconds. Four bombs tore the sea. 0915. We broke surface and chased forward, always ahead. A distress signal was handed to Siegman on the bridge. AIR attack. Sinking. U-6557. Again, every hand aboard wondered how long it would take until we too would be delivered to our maker. 1005. Alarm! An airplane had materialised as if by magic. U-230 crash-dived in record time. When the thunder of the detonations subsided, the boat was still afloat. We surfaced and crash-dived again and again. We ducked the blows, we trembled, shuddered and vibrated under the heaviest barrages. The boat broke slowly under the murderous attacks. Her rivets burst, her bolts cracked, her hull was dented and her ribs bent, but she still obeyed orders and the captain drove her mercilessly into firing position. By sunset, Siegmund's tenacious pursuit seemed about to be rewarded. Hidden from the escorts by the curvature of the earth, we had worked ourselves miles ahead of the convoy. But then one of the flying devils forced us below again, and as the convoy rocked and pounded through the sea, our men swiftly occupied their action stations, suspense carved into their faces. With stern determination, I prepared torpedoes and crew for a battle on the surface. My hopes failed unconditionally. In the turmoil and uproar of the approaching convoy, three escorts had somehow managed to zero in on our spot of submergence. Siegmann yelled in surprise, Achtung! Dive to 200 metres! Brace for depth charges! Seconds later, the sweepers presented us with an extravagant gift. A thick layer of depth charges exploded in an enormous eruption that dwarfed all previous barrages. Darkness followed the terrible quake. I pulled myself up the steel ropes of the scope, aimed the beam of my flashlight at the depth gauge, saw with horror its needle swinging rapidly saw the two planesmen dangling at their wheels in confusion, listened to the chief's desperate commands, and heard the shocking sound of splashing water. This was how the curtain went up for another long siege, an exact duplicate of the persecution we had just endured. As dusk settled upon the hunters above, the wind faded with the day and the sea smoothed, and as a result their bombardment increased in violence. The fierce salvos made the ocean roar and rumble. We shivered and sweated. We were both hot and cold as we neared the limits of human endurance. As the night wore on, deadly fumes escaped from our batteries. We were half poisoned and nearly unconscious. And when the sun rose for our assailants, they renewed their bombardment with over-above use, 
Hell 169 300 charges by actual count. It was all in vain. U-230 stayed afloat some 280 metres below. In the afternoon we faced the fact that we had absolutely no more leeway, no more air to breathe. We now had to choose between suicide and surrender. In a last effort to steal another hour from death or imprisonment, Friedrich released some compressed air into the midship buoyancy tank to raise the boat. The hissing sound attracted our assailants' attention. A ferocious blast pulled the boat upward. As the air in her tanks expanded, she rose with increasing speed. But then a battery of canisters detonated, violently slamming into her starboard side, sending her down again for the final crush. We crawled through the centre aisle to distribute our weight, even though we were sure this was our end. Then, very gently, U-230 levelled off near the 300 metre mark and vibrated in her last convulsive shakes. The men bit the mouthpieces of their rubber hoses, drawing hot air through the potash cartridges, incessantly coughing. Eight minutes after the blast, six more depth charges exploded astern. Then all remained silent for a long while, for well over an hour. There was not a ping, not a beep, not a sound from above. Having survived past the absolute limit of our air supply, we tempted the Tommies into a move with a hammer blow against the hull. There was no reaction. U-230 began her slow ascent. 1955. The lid of the hatch to the bridge flew open. Siegmund and I were thrown up to the bridge by the tremendous overpressure that had built up inside the hull. Radiant sunshine. Air in overabundance. But no enemy as far as the eye could see. After a careful check of sky and sea, we assessed our damages. The starboard aft oil bunker was broken wide open. Diesel oil had washed away, leaving a long, treacherous trail of iridescent colours in our wake. To the enemy, a large oil slick was an unmistakable evidence of a direct hit. That was why the British had departed. However, the boat was a shambles. Two tanks were ruptured, the starboard shaft was bent, the starboard diesel foundation was cracked, and countless smaller damages were reported. A large amount of fuel had been lost. A continuation of the mission was impossible. Even our return to base was highly doubtful. At 21.05, Riedel transmitted a message to headquarters, advising Admiral U-boats of our condition and the massive air defence in the centre of the Atlantic. He added that two convoys had gotten away without our being able to launch a single torpedo. But our many lost chances to add tonnage to our credit seemed insignificant when compared to our unexpected survival. Only a special providence had allowed us to live while so many others had perished in the sea. On the evening of May 15th, at the end of the four-day battle, it was confirmed that U-456 had been lost, and that two more boats had followed her to the bottom. U-266 and U-753 had never answered headquarters summons to report their position. The result of the fight was that six U-boats had been sunk and the seventh was battered and unable to continue. It was a disaster of the greatest magnitude and the second one in the month of May. The Allied counter-offensive at sea had struck with frightening power and accuracy. U-230 limped east through the vastness of the Atlantic. Luckily, no aircraft was sighted for two consecutive days. However, the calm was punctuated by a string of desperate signals from boats in distress. Decoding the death messages had become a normal part of our shipboard routine. The messages piled up on the captain's table, and in reading them I half expected to see one from U-230. Bombed by aircraft. Sinking. U-463 have lost contact. Attacked by aircraft. U-640 attacked by destroyer. Sinking. U-128 destroyers. Aircraft. Unable to dive. U-5228 attacked by aircraft. Sinking. U-646. Nothing was ever heard again of these boats. The thought of our destruction haunted us as more of the death cries were intercepted. It could be only hours, days at the most, until the killers would catch up with us and bring us death in our iron coffin. May 18th. 
At dawn, we were instructed to refuel at high sea from U-634 in Grid Square BE-81 on May 23rd. May 19th, the British scored two hits. U-954 and U-273 were bombed and sunk almost simultaneously. Their signals were identical, only the place of their dying was different. May 21, U-230 cruised for hours at the spot of rendezvous. By 13 and 15, we had begun to doubt the existence of U-634, but then Borchert with his magic eyes spotted the boat. Forty minutes later, we sailed alongside her. I discovered that her captain was Dahlhaus, an old friend from my mine-sweeping days in Holland. We strung rubber hoses from boat to boat while drifting parallel before the wind, and the pumps transferred 15 tonnes of diesel oil into our tanks. The fueling took almost two hours, two helpless hours of nervous waiting for airplanes to dive upon us. None appeared. With great relief, we separated from U-634, and both boats set course for Brest. May 23rd. U-230 crossed the 15th longitude west, the door to Biscay Bay, and Purgatory. We intercepted more bad news. A signal from U-91 told us that they had seen U-752 attacked and destroyed by aircraft. There were no survivors. At 10.40 we crash-dived before a Sunderland airplane. No radar impulses. Quite obviously it must have attacked on sight. It announced the start of a six-day nightmare. Under cover of darkness, U-230 made her dash at a pitiful top speed of only 12 knots. We crash-dived seven times and shook off 28 attacks by bombs or depth charges. By sunrise we were stunned, deaf and exhausted. We disappeared in the floods for the rest of the day. May 24th. Apparently the British were aware that two U-boats were running for port. Their aircraft seemed to be looking for us, including the land-based four-engined bombers. During that night we crash-dived nine times and survived a total of 36 bombing runs. May 25th. Three hours after daybreak we floated into the deadly range of a hunter-killer group. Running submerged in absolute silence, we managed to slip by the endless, cruel, ravenous pings. One hour before midnight, we surfaced into the inevitable air assaults. On the first attack, four ferocious detonations rocked the boat as she surged into the deep. Suddenly, there was a flash in the rear of the control room. A stream of sparks shot across the narrow space and enveloped us in choking smoke. The boat was afire. It seemed impossible to bring her to surface before we died. The round doors of the two bulkheads were slammed shut, the compartments sealed. Several men fought the fire with extinguishers. U-230 rose sharply toward the surface, where only seconds before the aircraft had dropped its diabolic calling card. Thick fumes choked us. Fire leaped from wall to wall. I pressed my handkerchief against mouth and nose and followed the captain into the tower. The boat levelled off. She had surfaced. We hastened to the bridge. Somebody threw ammunition magazines on deck. The port diesel began to mutter. Red light and fumes escaped the hatch. We drove like a torch through the blackest night until the men below managed to kill the fire. That night we outmanoeuvred seven attacks and outlasted 28 bombs. May 26. It was the fourth day of our run for life and port. We floated at 40 metres, listening to a depth charge barrage many miles to the west. It lasted all day. At 22.30 we surfaced. The night was very dark. Over an hour passed without radar detection. Then we saw a huge spotlight hanging in the sky, growing bigger with insane speed, drenching the bridge in daylight, blinding us. A four-engined liberator came roaring down, guns blazing. The boat swung toward the fast-approaching light. The giant roared over our bridge and catapulted into the night, showering the bridge with sparks and hot air. Four bombs exploded, bellowing barbarously. My legs were jarred into my body at each concussion. Moments later came the call from below. Boat is tight, ready for dive. When U-230 was balanced in protective depth, Siegmund stormed into the radio room, up to the mate who had failed to warn us of a radar detection. What the hell is the matter, Kastner? Are you asleep? 
you nearly got us all killed. Sir, there was no impulse, the mate protested, and our gear is in order. Don't tell me any stories, Kastner, hollered Siegmund. The entire crew is in your hands. If you fail again, our skins aren't worth a penny. May 27th. We surfaced, low on power and air. Tension was at a peak. My nerves twitched and my tongue was hot and dry. I reckoned that we would have no chance for survival if another attack occurred immediately. But for long minutes the roar of our one diesel and the sigh of the air intake was the only sound we could hear. After an hour of grace, time ran out again. A white shaft of light suddenly engulfed the bridge. The beam came at us from starboard aft. Again a giant liberator swooped down, its guns emitting small red flames, its bullets missing our heads by only centimetres. Then the plane roared into the night, headlight turned off. Four bomb bursts sent geysers of water into the air. The boat was violently shaken, but emerged without further damage. We dived immediately. As I passed the captain in his nook, he was unbuttoning his salt-caked leather jacket. Looking up, he said, I concede, exec, there were no radar impulses. Our metox seems to be in perfect order. The British must have invented a new kind of radar. It's the only explanation I can think of. We were stunned. First the aircraft carrier. Now a new electronic trick that permitted British planes to locate us without betraying their own position. There was no longer a reason for travelling submerged by day and on surface at night. We had to reverse our tactic and travel the surface during the day, when we could see our adversaries with the naked eye. Shooting it out in daylight seemed better than being hacked to pieces at night. At 0720 we surfaced. Our prospects of winning the last 170-mile dash to port were not at all promising. We spotted four Sunderlands and five Liberators. Nine times we crashed into depth and received the blood-curdling baptisms. Nine times we surfaced and ploughed ahead. We reached the continental shelf that afternoon. At nightfall we informed headquarters that we would be at the pick-up point the following morning at 0800. Then, taking no more chances in this new war at sea, we dived. On May 28th, at 12.40, U-230 sailed into the inner harbour of Brest. With her aft deck largely submerged and her superstructure damaged, she gave everyone on the pier a broad hint of what we had gone through. There was no band playing the military tunes, only the girls with the flower bouquets reminded us of the glorious past. The Commandant, Ninth Flotilla and his party showed signs of shock. We were hastily and unceremoniously transported to the compound. But once we were ushered into the reception hall, our landlubber hosts tried hard to make our homecoming a pleasant one. After the party, I returned to my room, the same room that I had abandoned five weeks before. My belongings had already been delivered from storage. As I retrieved the envelope containing my testament from one valise, I felt an overpowering gratitude. I had survived. In my mail, I found only two letters from Marianne. A multitude of strange thoughts flashed through my mind. Then a small parcel from home distracted me. Mother had sent me a birthday cake. It was already four weeks old and had hardened and broken into many pieces. But I wished to honour my mother's belief in her son's longevity, so I ate a piece of the cake anyway. The strenuous routine of the two days in port, stripping our boat and bringing her into dry dock, kept me from brooding over our misfortune. But I was reminded of our wrecked mission the next morning. I was at the pier by chance when ZJ-634 finally sailed into harbour, three days late. I thanked Dalhouse for his help, this time with a handshake. Nevertheless, I managed to suppress my morbid thoughts, to forget that death had been my constant companion during the month of May. With the self-renewing vigour of youth, I went out to embrace the hot and fast life in port. I joined my friends, those who had made it back from patrol, in a turbulent night in the casino bar. We celebrated everyone's birthday and danced with all of Madame's beauties. 
Madame had replenished her staff with several exotic flowers, ranging in colour from the white to yellow and coconut brown. Janine was as loving as ever, no matter that she gave her love to my friends in my absence. It might well prove their last hours of love and life. In fact, the U-boat war was fast becoming one long funeral procession for us. The Allied counter-offensive at sea had struck with unexpected and unprecedented force. The British and Americans had quietly, steadily massed their forces. They had increased their fleet of fast corvettes, built a number of medium-sized aircraft carriers, and converted a number of freighters into pocket-sized carriers, assembled squadrons of small planes for carrier duty, as well as huge armadas of long-range land-based bombers. Then they hit with sudden power and, in 38 cases, with frightening precision. This was the count of U-boats they had sunk in that fateful May of 1943. In those U-boats, many of my friends and classmates had met their end. Unless headquarters produced dramatic countermeasures, all our proud new U-boats would be turned into a terrible surplus of iron coffins. It was estimated that the overhaul of U-230 would take at least four weeks. Since I was eligible for a prolonged leave, I made plans for a stop in Paris, a visit at home, and a week with Marianne in the hot summer sun on the beach of the Vansay in Berlin. Yes, my leave was a long one, but I was all too aware that my time was limited. One evening in early June, having turned over my business to Riedel, I set off on an express to Paris. As the train flashed through the French countryside, I imagined hearing familiar sounds, hammering diesels, depth charge explosions, the detonations of bombs and torpedoes, the breaking of ships and the roar of the ocean. But it was only the unfamiliar noise of the train wheels as they clicked over the joints of the tracks. I arrived in Paris's Gare de Montparnasse while the morning was still fresh and new. A cab took me to my hotel near the Place Vendôme, which had been commandeered for naval officers. I had decided to remain unattached during my short stay in town, but the abundance of aggressive girls soon tested my resolve. I hurried into the cool halls of the Louvre and spent most of the day strolling through the Galerie d'Apollon, the Grand Galerie and the Salle des Cariotides, where, according to legend, many Huguenots had been hanged from the rafters. In the evening I went to an elaborate restaurant near the opera and dined in solitude and pomp. Then I wandered down the Boulevard des Capucines, declined several offers of commercial love, and retreated into the comforting silence of my hotel room. The next day, time stood still for me. In the morning, I walked through the Place de Pigalle, consumed a large breakfast in a small café in Montmartre, climbed the long stairway to Sacré-Cœur. I spent the afternoon and evening in luxurious idleness in the streets and cafés of the left bank. Paris, beautiful Paris, how I hated to leave her. But at 2200, I boarded my train for Germany. The morning sun was riding high when my express pulled into Frankfurt station. I noticed at once that the huge glass dome spanning the tracks was badly damaged. All the glass had been smashed in air raids, leaving only a naked steel skeleton. The sight made a gloomy prelude to my visit. As always, I returned home without notification, and when Mother answered the bell, she glanced at me as if I were a stranger. After a second, I said, Hello, Mother. You might as well let me in. It's good to be back. I noticed that Mother was unusually nervous, and that she had lost considerable weight. I believed I also noticed a hint of grief in her face. But instead of asking her questions, I tried to please her. I'm really glad I can stretch my legs under your table again. Naturally, she asked me whether I had enough to eat, insisted that I had become too thin, and wanted to know all about my health. Tell me, did you have enough underwear to keep yourself warm? You might not know, but we have given away whatever clothes we could spare to our soldiers on the Russian front. We have contributed all your shoes and your ski outfits as well as the skis. Tell me also, how is the war in the Atlantic? We don't hear as much any more about the U-boats. I told her that she would soon hear again of our successes. But having made up my mind that I would not discuss the war, I changed the subject. 
How is everybody? How is Trudy doing? Has she seen her husband lately? <coughs> Trudy is fine, just fine, she said. Hans was here on Easter. We had his parents too. They had some serious air raids in Dusseldorf and have left for the Black Forest to wait until things turn better. We also had some heavy attacks recently, but not as bad as they have been elsewhere. Then I asked, How is father? And mother burst out crying. With the tears running down her cheeks, she told me that he had been taken away. The Gestapo had arrested him three months ago. He was still imprisoned at the city jail in the Hamelsgasse. Mother sobbed. I didn't tell you in my letters. I didn't want you to know. Torn between disbelief and outrage, I managed to extract from her a vague account of what had happened. Father had maintained a more than just friendly and occasional relationship with a young woman. She had been one of his employees, and he had kept her on the payroll for a long time. One day he had asked Mother for a divorce to marry the girl, but this was not the reason for Father's arrest. The trouble was that the woman he loved was Jewish, and that according to the government's doctrine was a crime. He had committed another crime by hiding her from persecution. Unfortunately, somebody had found out and reported that the girl was Jewish, and so the Gestapo had seized the girl and father. They had put her into a camp and father into jail. I was shocked and angered by father's imprisonment, but I was not surprised by the injustice of it. He had suffered before at the hands of our government. Back in the winter of 1936, father's business, a finance company, had been closed down by edict, along with 36 similar firms. Simply because such companies no longer fit the policies of the leaders of the Third Reich, father was deprived of his life's work without warning, explanation or appeal, and he had to start all over again at the age of 46. It was only through ingenuity and hard work that he managed to build up a new business and provide for his family. Soon afterward, the government's ideological nonsense produced far uglier results. I myself had witnessed the Crystal Night in Frankfurt in 1938, when the mob had raged through the streets, smashing the windows and plundering the stores of Jews, while the police stood by and did nothing. The mob tossed furniture out of apartment windows, threw pianos over balcony railings, flung down china, books, lamps and household utensils. And when everything of value had been stolen, the rest was piled up and burned in huge bonfires. I remembered how my father had led me through the flaming wreckage to help a Jewish friend, only to find his apartment ransacked and vacant. It was then that I saw father in anger and with tears in his eyes. To us, the crystal night was shameful and tragic, but my father was not a rebel in search of hopeless causes, and neither was I. I knew that something was seriously wrong in the country I loved, but the war caught me up when I was nineteen, and I had neither the time nor the political interest to investigate. Now, however, I was inextricably entangled in an affair that made me feel like a flaming rebel, and I would have to see it through even if I damaged my position and my military career. Immediately I walked to Gestapo headquarters in the Lindenstrasse, a short distance from our home. My uniform and decorations got me past the guards without an interrogation. As I entered a large hall, a secretary at a desk near the entrance asked me whether she could help. I want to see Obersturm Banjura von Molitor, please. I put on a pleasant smile and handed her my calling card, adding, It will be a surprise for Herr von Molitor. I assumed he seldom saw a U-boat man, much less one whose father was behind bars. I had to wait just long enough to plan what I would say. Then the girl ushered me into a well-appointed room and introduced me to the chief SS officer in town. So this was a fearful SS man, whose snap of a finger could decide someone's life. The middle-aged officer in the light grey SS uniform looked more like a jovial businessman than a cold-blooded prosecutor. Von Molitor's greeting was as genial as his appearance. It's a pleasure to meet somebody from the Navy for a change. I know you serve in the U-boat force. Quite an interesting and exciting job, isn't it? What can I do for you, Lieutenant? 
I treated him with quiet severity. Sir, you are holding my father a prisoner. This is unreasonable. I demand his immediate release. The expression on his fleshy face changed from a friendly smile to profound consternation. He looked at my calling card, read my name again, and then stuttered. I was not informed that we had arrested the father of an outstanding soldier. I am sorry, Leutnant. It must be a mistake. I shall investigate at once. He wrote something on a piece of paper, pushed a button. Another secretary came through a second door and took the slip from his hand. You see, Leutnant, I am not informed about every single case, but I also realise that you would not be here if your father weren't in jail. Obviously, and I consider the reason for his arrest and imprisonment. Before I could make a serious blunder, the girl came back and handed von Molitor another note. He took the time to read it carefully, then said in a conciliatory tone, Leutnant, I am now aware of the case. You will have your father back by evening. I am sure that three months in solitary have taught him a lesson. I am sorry that it happened, but it was strictly of your father's making. I am glad I could help you and do you a favour. I hope you will now enjoy your furlough. Goodbye, Heil Hitler. Rising quickly, I thanked him briefly, not that he had done me a favour, for he could hardly have denied my request. I left with a provocative military salute. After I had reached the street, I remembered the girl who had been sent away, and I was sorry that I was unable to help her also. It was not until after the war that I learned she had somehow survived. Then I went to father's office to see my sister Trudy for the first time since her wedding. When I told her that father would be home for dinner, Trudy dissolved in tears. She said, sobbing, we tried to free father, but the Gestapo always refused to hear our pleas. You don't know how glad I am that you came home. Mother and father's marriage is on the rocks. It's a terrible situation. Since he's been in the Hammelsgasse, I have managed the business all by myself. I told her what a good girl she was, and that I was proud of her, and I proposed to close the office for the rest of the day and celebrate. She gave instructions to a female supervisor, and we made the short walk home. Mother was highly nervous and disturbed, but full of forgiveness. She was ready to forget the whole affair as long as father did not leave her. That possibility had been greatly reduced by the removal of the object of father's affections. It was almost dinner time when the key turned in the front door, and father, unaware of my presence, stepped into the vestibule. The moment he saw me, he realised that it was I who was responsible for his release from prison. We shook hands in silence. He wore a weak old beard. The Gestapo did not even have the decency to give him a shave. The evening dragged on uncomfortably. It was difficult for us to concentrate on a subject and keep the conversation going. I talked briefly about the Atlantic Front without telling the truth. The epic difficulties of our armies in the Russian theatre and the complete defeat of Rommel in North Africa troubled father more than his brush with the Gestapo. He also told me about the frequent air attacks on Frankfurt and spoke of moving his business out of town. We talked about many things, but father never touched on the subject of his romance, never indicated whether he would stay with mother. As far as I was concerned, nothing mattered but that father was home. As for the marriage, well, that was something he and mother had to work out between themselves. One day and one night later, I arrived in Berlin. Emerging from the Anhalter station, I was stopped in my tracks by the destruction. Broken glass, mortar and rubble were strewn everywhere. And for the first time, Marianne was not at the station. Intending to call on Marianne at her office, I boarded a streetcar bound for the centre of the capital. That ride was appalling. Large sections of the city had almost been levelled by the saturation bombings, leaving rubble, dust and a million tragedies. I felt as if the bottom were falling out of my world. I felt like running away and leaving the city on the next train. But I eventually reached the spot where Marianne had worked, that is, where her seven-storey office building had once stood. Only a few walls had remained. Bricks were piled up two storeys high. I turned away from the devastation, 
searched for and found the nearest subway stop, then took the express train to the suburb where Marianne lived with her parents. Leaving the station on foot, I saw here and there a home burned to the ground, an apartment house collapsed. It seemed that death and destruction were following me. As I neared Marianne's home, I braced myself against a reality I already sensed. Then I was standing before the heap of charcoal that had been the house. Its chimney poked into the air like a warning finger. Around it lay smashed bricks and blocks, black with soot, steel beams bent in the heat of the fire, jumbled debris of all sorts. Then I saw the sign stuck in the rubble. Somebody had written in red, All members of the Hardenberg family are dead. I read it two or three times before I turned away. I was unable to comprehend. Something acrid burned in my throat. I swallowed repeatedly. Then my heart suddenly hardened. At that moment all in me was dead, burned out like the homes. I was without emotion. The next express carried me back home to Frankfurt. With Marianne's death preying on my mind, I spent four aimless days in Frankfurt. I also spent one night in the cellar of our apartment house, listening to the screaming sirens and the bellowing of the flak, shaking to the tremors of the exploding bombs and looking into the serious, stony faces of people who accepted the raid as a routine event. When it was all over, the night was filled with the caustic stench of cordite, the moans of the wounded, and the bells of the fire brigades. This was what the war had come to, that my Marianne was an air raid victim, that my family had grown accustomed to living underground in fear of their lives. After that night, there was nothing left for me at home. I had to return to my boat and fight the war at sea to a successful end for the sake of those who remained at home in anguish and dread. After a night on a darkened train, I arrived in Paris. The city breathed peace, and the hot June sun gilded the trees and rooftops. The heat made my uniform uncomfortable and set me to thinking about the advantages of civilian clothes. How I would enjoy pretending to be a part of the sophisticated Parisian crowd, which did not care about the war one way or the other. There I noticed that the most elegant Parisiennes paid no attention whatsoever to men in uniform. I realised how far I was from their lives of splendour, beauty and charm. How deep was the gulf between the peaceful crowds in the city and us on the front, who had no choice but to sail and fight and die. I arrived in the compound in Brest late in the evening, and found Riedel and my other friends in high spirits in the flotilla's bar. I joined their merry party, and we made the bar tremble with our rough exuberance and echo with our ribald sea chantés. This was what we all needed to help us forget that our number would soon be called, that we all had but a short reprieve to sing and drink. This was what I needed to counteract the twin shocks of Marianne's death and father's trouble with the Gestapo. I needed my friends, strong drinks and the excitement of the wanton life to bring me sweet forgetfulness. I also needed duty and hard work. In the days that followed, I had all these and more in abundant supply. I quickly adjusted to the old routine, made my daily trips to the shipyard, took a firm hold of the crew. Only one man caused me any real difficulty. That one, a seaman, used to jump the wall at night to join the fun in town. He had the bad luck to get himself involved in frequent fistfights, usually over girls, and I decided to send him away for eight days, into solitary, that is. Otherwise, he was an excellent man and reliable as soon as our boat left port. During my short absence, there had been a remarkable addition to the flotilla's staff. The importance of the flotilla's place in the Navy had been discovered, and with it the need for a staff photographer to record interesting events for posterity. The photographer turned out to be an attractive young woman, her casual good morning prompted me to issue an invitation to a drink. As soon as we sat down at the bar, I said, You have a very familiar southern accent. Yours is not exactly Berlinish either, she retorted with a smile. I admit that. I grew up on Lake Constance, on the North Shore. What a coincidence, she said. 
I lived across the lake, in Constance. I am Veronica. Everybody calls me Vera. I invited Vera for dinner, and she accepted without thinking it over. After my day's work was done, I took a swim in the pool, which was another new addition to the compound. Then it was time for our rendezvous. I knocked at the door of the bungalow Vera had received in lieu of an apartment. We left the compound and strolled through the narrow streets of Brest in the fading afternoon sun. For dinner, we had snails broiled in butter and herbs, shrimps and tartar sauce, a large lobster and a bottle of Beaujolais. Then we went to a small secluded café and we danced to the music of a piano player who obliged us with all the tunes we requested. Soon we returned to the compound and it was a strange experience to be admitted to the flotilla's closely guarded quarters with a female. From that night on, I met Vera regularly after work. The evenings were ours. One Saturday, I recalled my vow to buy a civilian suit and invited Vera to join me in a search for material and a tailor. Despite the depletions of the long war, one tailor offered an amazing variety of fabrics without ration tickets. I chose a plaid fabric, had my measurements taken, a price fixed, and a date set for delivery of the finished suit. I was not the least disturbed that I might never have an opportunity to wear it. With this purchase, I somehow forced myself to be optimistic. In those few remaining days in port, there was plenty of reason for pessimism. When a friend failed to return from patrol, when the truth about our losses in May was confirmed, when a boat crawled into harbour severely beaten, when reports of mounting losses circulated through the mess halls. Then the memory of our watery hell came back to my mind, and a presentiment of disaster rose like a wall between the two lives I led. The worst of it was that our boys were unable to sell their lives dearly. For all of our casualties, we had sunk in April only one-third as many ships we sent down in March, and only fifty enemy vessels, totalling a mere 265,000 tonnes, had been sunk in the disastrous month of May. As of mid-June, the U-boat war had come to a virtual standstill. Sixteen more boats had been lost in a fortnight, and Admiral Dennitz had called for a temporary halt in our attacks on the shipping lanes of the North Atlantic. The surviving boats were redeployed but not withdrawn from the front. On the contrary, to offset our stunning losses, great efforts were made to refloat boats in dry dock, and to finish those under construction in shipyards. The idea was that every boat we had, even the unsound and outmoded ones, should be put into action to show the Allies that our back had not been broken. Donitz, in a speech he made in Lorient, assured us that our battle reverses were only temporary, that the tide would be turned by our countermeasures, but that in the meantime we would have to go on sailing. Our efforts, he said, would tie up Allied naval forces in the Atlantic and keep Allied bombers away from our cities. At the end of June, I took U-230 out of dry dock and brought her to the pier, where her fitting out was to be completed. With that one decisive movement, all our adventures in port came to an end. All that was real was the boat, the war, and the inevitable clash with the enemy. These were the facts. Everything else was merely a wishful dream. Twenty minutes later we were there. The captain said, Have a seat, gentlemen. It will take a while for what I have to say, and what you are going to hear must not leave this room. Headquarters has selected us for a special mission. The prime objective of our next patrol will be the laying of mines. The target is the east coast of the United States. We will take aboard 24 magnetic mines of latest design, and plant them in Chesapeake Bay, more precisely in front of the US naval base at Norfolk. I do not have to point out the dangers of this undertaking, and I insist that our destination remain a secret until we are at sea. I would not like to arrive in the United States to find a reception committee waiting. One thing more. The waters of the Chesapeake Bay are too shallow to permit a submerged operation, so we will have to execute our mission on surface. I ask you, Exec, to secure all necessary charts of that area and keep them under lock and key. The three of us had listened intently and greeted the plan as a welcome departure from a routine patrol. Concerned about our defence, I asked the captain, 
If we have to store 24 mines, that doesn't allow us to take more than two torpedoes. Two is correct, exec. The rest of the space will be taken up by the mines, for which you will be responsible. Friedrich asked, how much fuel are we going to take aboard? Just the regular amount. Everything is well organised. We will be supplied by one of our large U-tankers somewhere near the West Indies, our future area of operation. There we will receive plenty of food, fuel and torpedoes. You, Riedel, will have the crew fitted out with tropical gear and arrange for that special diet for the tropics. And Siegmann concluded, Gentlemen, I expect to stay at sea for the remainder of the summer. On July 1st, we took over the mines. The strange supply of elongated capsules stirred immediate speculation among the boat's company. Some of the men were positive we would mine an English port. Others thought that the place would be Gibraltar Harbour. The smart ones, however, believed we would travel as far as the important West African port of Freetown. I smiled at the heated discussions and was glad to see that the crew was as eager as ever to go to sea. But the closer we came to the date of our seagoing, the more sceptical I became about any imminent betterment of our situation in the Atlantic. None of the anticipated improvements had been installed aboard U-230. The METOX, our radar detection gear, was still said to be the ultimate in radar warning devices. Additional anti-aircraft guns had been promised, but had not arrived in port in sufficient numbers. Rumours about new inventions, such as a rubber coating around the hull and superstructure to reduce radar and ASDIC detection, proved to be just that. Mess hall rumours. The only real improvement was the installation of armoured plating around the bridge in lieu of our rigid radar, which was as obsolete as the 8.0-centimetometers cannon on foredeck that had also been dismantled. As things stood, all the odds were against us. The British were throwing in planes in such huge numbers that scarcely a U-boat could traverse the Bay of Biscay undetected. Within a six-week period, the Allies had reduced our active U-boat force by 40%, and many of the survivors had yet to break through the blockade and reach port safely. Notwithstanding the terrible attrition in our ranks, we still believed that we would reverse the tide if we held out long enough. We had to hold out. Two days before sailing, I went to see my tailor again. He had not completed the suit as promised. I told him to have it ready in two weeks, and as an inducement I paid him the balance of the price. I did not wish to be indebted to him in case I did not return. Monday, July 5th. The departure of U-230 was scheduled for the evening. During the day we received an additional passenger. Because of the anticipated length of our voyage and the recent increase in injuries inflicted upon gunners and lookouts by aircraft gunfire, headquarters had added a doctor to our crew. He arrived at the pier laden down with several suitcases, as if he were embarking on a pleasure cruise. Hello, Herr Leutnant, he said. My name is Dr. Rescher. I will try to take good care of your men, but I must admit I have never been on a ship, much less a U-boat. Would you please show me my cabin? Our boys, listening with broad grins on their faces, made some inappropriate remarks. I shook the doctor's slender hand and explained apologetically, Doctor, there is no such thing as a cabin aboard a U-boat. Also, we have no room for all that luggage. Please take only what you really need, about one quarter of what you have there, and follow me below. After he had reduced his baggage, I managed to accommodate him in the warrant officer's wardroom, assigning him the berth above the navigators. At sundown we attended our farewell party in the compound, then went to man the boat in small, silent groups. Everyone, from the captain down to the lowliest seaman, said nothing of his thoughts about our imminent encounter with the deadly foe. It had become widely known, despite all efforts to keep it a secret, that the enemy was sinking three out of five of our boats as they made their runs through the Bay of Biscay. On June 24th alone, the Tommies had sent four U-boats to the bottom within 16 hours. The night was stark and moonless when U-230 sailed. No band, no ceremony, no cheering crowd betrayed our clandestine departure to French partisans or English agents. These days British intelligence had its eyes and ears on us everywhere. 
in the compound, in the shipyard, in the restaurants, and even in the etablissements. At the tip of Brittany, where the rocks of the coast sink into the ocean, we were picked up by a Coast Guard vessel which guided us south along the shore to a rendezvous with other U-boats from Lorient. The night passed without incident, and at dawn we joined U-506 and U-533. We three had been ordered to travel together through the Bay of Biscay, using our combined firepower to ward off British air attacks. As the boats converged, four escorts circled, the strange assembly on tense alert. The three U-boat captains carried on a shouted conversation through megaphones, discussing the strategy of the group march. They were to travel at the high speed of 18 knots on surface during the day, to stay submerged but in close contact all night, and to surface at dawn upon command. If an airplane was detected at a safe distance, the captain of U-533 would wave a yellow flag, indicating that all three boats should crash dive. But if he waved a red flag, the aircraft had already come too close for a safe dive, and all three boats were supposed to shoot it out. This plan, so cleverly conceived by our staff officers in the security of their office, was faulty in conception and nearly impossible to execute. For lack of anything better, however, the three captains agreed to try their luck. At 0810, the three boats turned their bows westward and began their attempt to break through the enemy's heavy defence. The escorts steamed east, back into port, as we hurried off. It was a humid and hot day, a good day to spend at the beach. Clouds were high, haze lingered low. The metox was quiet. Three strained hours passed without interference or contact. 11.35. The yellow flag went up on board U-533, the same instant we spotted the aircraft about 10,000 metres on starboard. All three boats ducked. Thirty minutes later, we heard U-506 sending the signal to surface on her newly acquired underwater sound device. Like trained seals, three U-boats broke surface simultaneously. They went to full speed and hammered westward, leaving three long foamy wakes. 1310. A Liberator shot out of the cloud cover, distance 3,000 metres. Too late to dive. The red flag went up at once, and on all decks the guns were manned. The big black bird dived down for attack. But before we had the range to open fire, the plane turned away and began to circle our group. 13.18. A second Liberator appeared in the sky, a new variation on a familiar theme. Both aircraft kept circling at a respectful distance. I ordered more ammunition to the bridge and more stored in the conning tower. Diving at this point was out of question. Trapped by the planes, the three boats dampened the Tommy's eagerness to attack by sending bursts of gunfire toward them. The diesel's thundering noise filled the air, and from above came the low throbbing roar of the aircraft's engines. 1325. A Sunderland dived through the clouds and joined the two liberators in their circling. Its appearance reduced even further our meagre chances for escape. 13 and 32. With the arrival of a third Liberator, the fourth aircraft, our chances sank to zero. Our patrol, only a few hours old, seemed to have come to a premature end. We waited for the assault with only a small spark left of the confidence with which we had sailed. 1340. A Liberator plunged into attack. The guns of three U-boats blazed at the pilot, who seemed insane to fly into our concentrated fire. But quickly a second Liberator fell upon us from the opposite side, forcing us to divide our firepower. All three boats began wild zigzag movements to spoil our attacker's aim. One of the planes, diving down on U-230 with flames spurting from its gun barrels, dropped its bombs and roared by, missing our bridge by only three metres. Four explosions, four giant geysers. One man on our lower gun sagged and fell to the deck. Another replaced him. Moments later, four more fountains erupted around the tower of U-506 as the second plane cut through our firing line. We lowered the wounded gunner into the boat and heaved fresh ammunition to the bridge. Suddenly, C-506 dived. 
the four Tommies, seeing their chances, flew a combined attack. Then something unexpected happened. U-506 returned to the surface immediately, and some men jumped to the guns. The boat made a sharp turn to port, avoiding the bombs dropped by the Sunderland. The explosions boomed between the bellowing of our flak and the plane's stuttering guns, and the roar of our diesels and the thunder of aircraft engines. The sea fumed from multiple exhausts and foamed from bomb bursts. The air shrieked with shrapnel and bullets ricocheting off our armour plating. Rising from its dive, the Sunderland caught a burst, shuddered and fell slowly into the sea. After the Sunderland had crashed, its comrades retreated. That was the moment we acted. With racing engines, the three U-boats ducked in an instant and dived. We were not quite down in safe depths when the tremor of detonating bombs told us that the British had not yet given up. That was the end of our plan to travel in a group through the Bay of Biscay. Our contact with the two other boats was soon lost. Neither of the two reached port again. U-506 was sunk six days after the encounter, and U-533 was destroyed twelve weeks later, both victims of Allied air attacks. Dr. Raisha, shaken by fear and seasickness, managed to treat our one casualty who had been shot in the upper right thigh. Luckily, the bullet had passed without smashing any bones. Raisha bandaged the gunner with greatest difficulty, and when he had finished he crawled into his bunk, himself badly in need of help. Day and night the pursuers continued to bombard us savagely. We were hunted, persecuted, and almost driven insane. Dozens of times we crashed into the depths and the detonations reached after us, and yet day after day, for seven days in a row, we managed to escape. And when U-230 reached the rolling prairies of the mid-Atlantic, where we were relatively safe, we rose from the depths astounded by our survival. As usual, others had not shared our luck. During the same period, U-514 and E-232 were hacked to bits on July 8th, and U-435 was sunk one day later. On July 12th, the enemy scored two hits, destroying U-506 and U-409, and the next day the British bombed U-607. All these boats were lost in the Bay of Biscay, perilously close to our route of march. Passing from the bay, out of range of the land-based bombers, we ducked only two or three times a day, gaining long hours on surface. The boat was cleaned of its mould and rot, the bilges scrubbed and the refuse thrown overboard, a routine we had omitted in the bay. We also prepared our mines for the drop and our torpedoes for use when needed. Now, on watch, we enjoyed bright days, and the blazing sun burned our skins deep brown. The crew began to show signs of appetite, and some machinists came up into the conning tower to puff a pipe or smoke a cigarette. The only one who never saw the sun, who never even rose from his berth, was our doctor. Resch slowly dissolved on his mattress in seasickness. Yellow and thin, he rested quietly in his narrow bunk, accepted nothing, asked for nothing. It was only when we submerged for our regular trim dive, coming to rest for a while at sixty metres, that the doctor emerged from his leather bed, reminding us that he was still on board. U-230 proceeded steadily toward her destination. On most days, we reduced the distance to Chesapeake Bay by approximately 160 miles, depending upon the severity of the harassment from above. The stream of signals from boats in distress never ceased. Around that time, J7509 reported that she had been heavily damaged by aircraft and needed parts urgently, but nothing was heard from her again. The radio mate not only deciphered distress signals, he also typed and multigraphed the armed forces communiques he intercepted daily. We were startled by the news of swift Allied landings on Sicily and dismayed by word of continuing reverses in the Russian theatre. The world was aflame, and the flames blazed highest where they were the least expected, inside Germany. Our Luftwaffe, neglected by Göring and decimated by the Allies, could not prevent the Allied air flotillas from bombing our cities into ashes. Suddenly it struck me that the recent disasters of the U-boat force bore alarming resemblances to the defeat of the Luftwaffe in the air. 
But despite the burnings and bombings, the retreats and defeats and the imminent danger of our own destruction, we kept our hopes high. We had been told that the war would be won and we still believed it, and still our U-boats continued to die. On July 20th, a radio signal told us that the logbook of one of our friends of better days in Brest was closed forever. The message, aircraft, attacked, sinking, imprisonment, U-558, was his last report.